It is my honor to welcome you to today's Security Policy Forum event, sponsored by the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies in the Elliott School of International Affairs here at the George Washington University. The topic is advising the president on U.S. national security. And I can't think of a more qualified group to address it. On our panel, we have the top academic expert on the U.S. National Security Advisory System and a former National Security Advisor to the President. Our moderator, commentator, is an expert on U.S. foreign policy decision making. If I'm allowed a moment to channel for Mike Brown, Dean of the Elliott School, I'd have to say that this event, like so many others at the Elliott School, testifies to our unique location literally across the street from the Department of State and doors down from the White House. Let me now introduce our panel in alphabetical order. Mac Dessler is the Saul Stern Professor at the School of Public Policy, University of Maryland. He specializes in the politics and processes of U.S. foreign policy making. His recent book with Ivo Dalder, now U.S. Ambassador to um, NATO, <laughs> In the Shadow of the Oval Office, Simon & Schuster, 2009, analyzes the role of the President's National Security Advisor from the Kennedy through to the George W. Bush administration. His American Trade Politics won an award from the American Political Science Association for the best book on national policy. Other recent Dessler works include Misreading the Public, The Myth of a New Isolationism, Brookings Institution. Professor Dessler received a PhD from Princeton University. James Goldgeier is a professor of political science and international affairs at the George Washington University. He taught previously at Cornell University and has held appointments at Stanford, the State Department, the National Security Council, the Brookings Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Library of Congress, among others. From 2001 to 2005, he directed George Washington's Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. He is the co-author, most recently, of America Between the Wars, from 11.9 to 9.11. As his colleague, I add that uh, his book has been very well received and reviewed, and has made a number of best book lists. Professor Goldgeier received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Stephen J. Hadley, completed four years as the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs on January 20th, 2009. In that capacity, he was the principal White House Foreign Policy Advisor to then President George W. Bush. He also directed the National Security Council staff and ran the interagency national security process. In President Bush's first term, Mr. Hadley was the Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor serving under then National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. Mr. Hadley has held various other positions in government. From 1989 to 1993, he served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy. He was counsel to the Tower Commission in 1987 as it investigated U.S. arms sales to Iran and served on the National Security Council under President Ford from 1974 to 1977. During his professional career, Mr. Hadley has served on a number of corporate advisory boards. Among his current positions, Mr. Hadley serves on the board of directors of the U.S. Institute for Peace. Mr. Hadley received his BA from Cornell University and Juris Doctorate from Yale Law School. I will now turn the program over to Jim Goldgeier. Uh, after the panelists have spoken, we will have time for questions and answers, and I'll circulate through the audience with a microphone. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, each of our uh, panelists is going to uh, make some formal remarks uh, about the issue. And then uh, I'm going to follow that up uh, by getting the discussion going with, with a few questions that I have for each of them. And then we'll open it up to you all. So we're going to start with Steve. And thanks again for coming. Thank you very much. It is. Uh, a real opportunity and an honor for me to be with you this afternoon. I appreciate it very much. 
I want to talk a little bit about uh, national security process of decision making, the role of the president, and the role of the national security advisor. My uh, comments will be based on my own experience. My perspective is not that of a scholar or a journalist, but of a national security practitioner with all the limitations that the, that, that entails. Um, to begin with, as we approach this subject, we need to recognize that uh, ours is a presidential rather than a parliamentary system, and that makes a big difference. Our Congress established three co-equal branches of government, but it gave the president the lead in foreign and security policy. Having said that, it is the Congress that pays the bills, that confirms the appointments to the executive branch, and that is charged with the oversight of foreign and national security policy. The result is that our two branches of government, the executive and the legislative, are condemned to struggle over the control of foreign policy, and they do. It is a dynamic tension. It is often contentious, uh, but over time, it has served our nation well. If you look at it historically, uh, power has ebbed and flowed. When a president gets in trouble, particularly politically, as, for example, President Nixon did after Watergate and the Vietnam War, then Congress asserts itself. On the other hand, if the nation is attacked or we're facing a severe national security crisis, as was the case, for exa example, after 9-11, then the president moves into the fore, ebb and flow. And it has been that way throughout our history. Within the executive branch, it is the president who makes foreign policy. Now, that sounds like a truism, but if you read the press in this town, there is an enormous <laughs> focus on the cabinet level players, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Vice President, the National Security Advisor, the Secretary of the Treasury. What do they think? What are they doing? Reams of stories are written about what Secretary Clinton thinks, what is, where Secretary Gates is on an issue, and what is Tom Donilon doing behind the scenes. Uh, Sometimes in the reporting, the president is almost a two-dimensional figure whose only job is to choose among the brilliant options presented to uh, the president by their national security principles. Well, nothing could be further from the truth in my experience. What matters in the end is what the president thinks about an issue. Here's why. Winning the presidency is perhaps the most demanding challenge anybody can undertake. And it's getting harder and more grueling with every election cycle. It tests you in every dimension of your being. And in some sense, it is probably the best preparation for being president. And if you win, you are psychologically ready to be president. And the central feature of being president is making decisions. Let me tell you a story. The first year of the Bush administration, I happened to be sitting with President Bush at a dinner. I did not know him well at that point, and I screwed up my courage and said, Mr. President, what do you, Mr. President, what do you like most about being president? He said something very interesting. He said, it's two things. One, he says, I like to be able to reach out and touch someone for maybe a minute or two and make, however fleetingly, a difference in their lives. And the second thing he said is, I asked my dad, President Bush 41, uh, what he liked about a president being president. And Bush 41 said to his son, well, son, if you like making decisions, you're going to love being president, because that's what you do. That's what presidents do. Uh, that's what presidents do. And in my service in four different uh, administrations, I'm always surprised by the extent to which the big decisions in our system come to the president. And that's how it should be. Because among the participants in the national security decision-making process, the president and the vice president are the only ones who are elected. And the president is the one that the American people have selected to make decisions, big decisions, on their behalf. So how does the president make decisions? 
president sits atop an enormous executive branch bureaucracy and multiple of multiple departments and agencies. And there's an old saying, what you see depends on where you sit. And each of these departments and agencies has its own particular mission, its own history, its own culture, and its own bureaucratic interests. Each tends to see things from its own unique perspective and not necessarily from the standpoint of the overall interests of the nation. The president's task is to set the goal and objective for dealing with a particular challenge or opportunity, to develop an overall strategy for achieving that goal of, of, and, or objective, and then integrating the efforts of all those various departments and agencies toward that end. The, most big, the, the biggest challenge I would submit is this integrating approach, overcoming the parochial bureaucratic interests of the various departments and agencies and bringing them together behind a common approach that serves the national interest. In this way, the nation brings to bear all the elements of national power, diplomatic, economic, military, development assistance, promotion of our values and principles to achieving common goals and objectives. That is what we mean by the whole of government approach, which you've heard, uh, I'm, I'm sure, quite frequently. And it's what we mean by integrating across the bureaucratic stovepipes. The National Security Council system is the president's <coughs> chief tool for accomplishing this result. And the top of that system is the National Security Council itself. Um, it is a much un misunderstood body in many ways. It was created by the National Security Act of 1947. It actually has only four statutory members, the President, the Vice President, Secretary of State, and Secretary of Defense, just those four. Other members are invited by the President, depending on the subject, to attend these meetings. Most frequent additions are the, dire the Director of National Intelligence, to talk about intelligence advice, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to provide military advice, and the Secretary of the Treasury to provide economic advice. The NSC is not a decision-making body. The, when you see news reports that the NSC today decided, it did not. The NSC advises the President, and the President decides. It is a very flexible institution, that can be molded to reflect the decision-making style of the president. <coughs> the statutory language establishing the NSC emphasizes this integrative role. It talks about the mission of the NSC to provide for integration of domestic, foreign, and military policies, to help the agencies of government, quote, cooperate more effectively in matters involving the national security. So the whole of government approach, the integrating across the bureaucratic stovepipes, it's in the very charter or the very DNA of the National Security Council system. Now, the National Security Council does this by bringing together the President's senior national security and foreign policy advisors to discuss issues directly with the President, either informally or informal NSC meetings. The National Security Council presides over a network of interagency committees at various levels of the government that bring together representatives of all the departments or agencies that have interest in a particular subject. These interagency committees make decisions at their level where they can, and where they cannot, they develop options and alternatives that they send up the chain first to the deputies committee, made up of the deputy secretaries of the various key departments, then to the principals committee, made up of the cabinet secretaries, and finally to the National Security Council itself. This process of interagency committees is overseen by the NSC staff. It's two to 250 uh, people, professional, non-political, 
on detail from government agencies most frequently, but also sometimes hired from outside from inner universities or think tanks. It's the job of the staff to run these interagency committees, to staff the president for his unique role in foreign policy and national security by preparing memos when the president is gonna meet with a head of state or have a phone call with a head of state, to prepare and plan presidential trips, to provide information briefs, and occasionally to brief the president in person on key issues. But how does the president actually make decisions? The material coming from the National Security Council staff, from the interagency committees, and from meetings of, his top, of the president's top national security officials are only one set of in, inputs into a president's decisions. Their focus is largely on generating options, outlining the pros and cons of those options, and giving the president a chance to hear directly from the president's national security principles. But the process by which a president actually reaches a decision is far more complex and involves critical insights uh, and inputs from outside the formal NSC process. The president will see, receive relevant information and lots of it from a wide variety of sources. There are the morning intelligence briefings, there are conversations the president has with world leaders and congressional leaders. There are meetings with experts from outside of the government. There are inputs from long-standing personal friends in which the president has confidence. And there are the comments from extraordinary, ordinary Americans that a president meets on the rope line after giving a speech someplace out in the heartland of this country. One of the jobs of the National Security Advisor is to encourage, facilitate, and arrange for these informal inputs. So the president has information from a wide range of sources. What the National Security Advisor should not do is try to cut off these channels of information or try to route them through the formal NSC process. But more fundamentally, the NSC process, like any other analytical process, is better at clarifying choices than actually yielding decisions. In making a decision, the president draws, presidents draw on their own internal resources, their sense of history, their view of the role of the United States in the world, their understanding of human nature, their assessment of world leaders, both allies and adversaries, their understanding of politics, and perhaps most importantly, their own fundamental set of core beliefs and core principles. Let me give you um, uh, an experience from President George Bush, who I worked for for eight years. It's interesting that at his core of his being, if you will, was a belief that all people regardless of religion, national origin, or the like, have the right, desire, and capacity to be free. And that people will make better decisions for themselves than governments or other institutions will make for them. And this theme you saw in, throughout his domestic and foreign policy. It undergirded everything from tax cuts, which he talked about as letting the people spend the money, they'll do it more wisely than the government will. It informed his policy on education, uh, no child left behind, the belief that every child can learn and has the right to the kind of education that will enable that child to take charge of their own life. And it extends also to President Bush's promotion of freedom in the Middle East. His belief that America's past attempts to purchase stability at the price of supporting dictators was a, a bad bargain that would not work in the long run and in the short run produced the kind of despair and hopelessness that made the Middle East a fertile recruiting ground for the terrorists. 
I would submit that it is these internal resources, experiences, and convictions that in the end are the critical ingredients of presidential decisions. And one of the privileges of the National Security Advisor is to witness and aid to presidents as they apply their internal perspectives to tough problems and make critical decisions for the country. Let me talk a little more directly about the role of the National Security Advisor. It is, uh, in my view, the best job in government. You get to run the process for developing options that go to the president, you get to oversee that process, and then you get to oversee and direct the process by which presidential decisions are implemented. It is the least encumbered by ceremonial or as Condi Rice used to call them, the Queen Elizabeth functions that other cabinet secretaries have to perform. And you're usually the last person who sees the president before the president makes a major decision and have an opportunity to help the president think their way through to a decision. As with the NSC system itself, the role of the National Security Advisor changes based on the style and personality of the president and the particular personality of the national security advisor. Still, there is a fairly well-established base case for the national security advisor, a starting point about what the, wall, the, the role should be. And it was well described in the 1987 Tower Board Report. That report was prepared after the failures of the National Security Council system um, that involved the sale of arms to Iran in an effort to secure the release of American hostages held by Hez Hezbollah. This base case has about four elements. First, be an honest broker. If you're a national security advisor, run a transparent decision-making process that involves all the NSC principles and allow them to get their unvarnished views before the president. Don't exclude the cabinet secretaries. Don't run a White House process uh, that gets things to a decision point uh, past the point that cabinet secretaries can have much of an impact. Bring them in from the beginning. Don't try to insert yourself between the president and the president's cabinet secretaries, but insist that the president deal with them directly through one-on-one -on -one meetings and phone calls. I'll give you an example. You have a National Security Council meeting. Maybe it deals with policy in Iraq. The President says at the end of the meeting, I'm going to th think overnight on this issue. I'll let you know in the morning. You come at 7 o'clock in the morning to see the President. The President says, I thought about it. I want Gates to do X, Y, and Z. Go tell him. Your answer is, Mr. President, Secretary Gates reports to you in the chain of command. You have a phone on your desk that is a direct drop to Secretary Gates. Might I suggest you pick it up and use it? It was a little more delicate than that. But the point was, you want to encourage the president to deal directly with the president's cabinet secretaries. Um, and a concomitant of that is don't undermine the national security principles with the president in order to advance your own status. And I will tell you, it is so easy Proximity gives you that power if you want to abuse it. I'll give you another example. Here's how you do it. You get up at 4.15 in the morning, which is what you do. So you're in the office by 5.15, and you're going through the newspapers, and there it is on the front page of the Washington Post. There is a leak that you know, say coming out of the State Department maybe, that is going to put the president right through the overhead. Now you have two choices. One choice, the self-aggrandizing choice, is to go to the president at 7 o'clock when he comes in and say, Mr. President, you probably saw the leak in the front page of the Post. I told the Secretary of State that, she, that he or she had to get a handle on their building. You know, this is the kind of stuff that happens over there. They're out of control. But don't worry, Mr. President, I'll call the Secretary right away, and I'll get it fixed for you. <laughs> don't do it. Instead, at 6.15 in the morning, call the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and say, Condi, Bob, have you seen the front page of the, Wall of the Washington Post today? Well, you're not going to like it, and the President's not going to like it. There's a leak on X, Y, and Z, and I know when I go see the President at 7 o'clock, he's going to ask me about it. You may want to see if you can get 
to the bottom of it before then. Then when you go to the president at 7 o'clock, the president says to you, did you see the leak on the front page of the Washington Post? You say, yes, Mr. President. I saw it. I already talked to Condi or I talked to Gates. They're all over it. They're on top of it. That's the outcome you want. Because it is in your interest and the president's interest for the president to have confidence in the president's cabinet secretaries. It will make them more effective. Second, give your own advice confidentially to the president. Don't talk publicly about what you're advising the president. It's a great ego trip. Well, I told the president, again, don't do it. What it means really is sitting back in a National Security Council meeting and watching the interaction between the president and the principals and make sure that the president is getting views from every one of those principals around the table. Then when the meeting ends, the president goes back up to the Oval Office, a little relaxed, feet up on the, on the desk and says, so heads, what do you think? Then in confidence, you give them your views. At the same time, there's going to be times um, when you want to make sure that while giving your advice, advice confidentially to the president, you also don't surprise your NSC colleagues by what your views were. One of the most useful things I did as National Security Advisor was the Tuesday afternoon lunch. It was, I called it lunch, it really wasn't. It was four o'clock in my office, only the Secretary of State, Defense, the Vice President, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the two Intelligence Chiefs, and my deputy. Sat around the table, I used to serve corn chips and warm cheese dip and Diet Cokes all around. Uh, it relaxed people. People in the afternoon, when they're old, they get a little hungry, so it sweetens their disposition. And we would, at that meeting, talk through all the difficult operational interests so that everybody knew their views. And I would share my inclination at that time so that the other cabinet secretaries could do two things. One, they could inform me of their views, because I might be wrong. And two, they would have an opportunity, knowing my views, to include that in their own presentations that would go to the president. Don't surprise them, but give your advice confidentially to the president. <laughs> Third, keep a low profile. Operate largely off stage. Make your NSC staff understand that you don't want reports in the newspapers about how wonderful you are or how the NSC staff is running foreign policy. It does not help create a sense of solidarity and teamwork which you need among your NSC principals. It is a very tough job and there is a lot of pressure. And you want people pulling together, not pulling apart. And if you're out there grandstanding in the press, it will not help that process. You will sometimes have to speak on behalf of the president. This is for budding national security advisors in this group. I'm giving you my best advice. You will some have to speak publicly before the press, and you'll have to do the dreaded Sunday shows. You know, five Sunday shows in two and a half hours. Uh, but when you speak, don't speak in your own name. Speak on behalf of the President of the United States. It's your job to explain what the President is thinking and doing, not your own personal views. And don't compete with your fellow National Security Council principals. They are confirmed by the Senate. They testify before the Congress. They're given the money and personnel by Congress to carry out America's national security and foreign policy. They have line responsibility. As national security advisor, you have a different role. It is a great job, but it is essentially a staff function. Your job is to help the cabinet secretaries do their job so that the president's policies can succeed. We used to have a saying around the NSC, I don't know if still is, Every success is the sex, success of the president or the president's cabinet officers. And every failure is because the National Security Advisor or the NSC staff fa failed to properly coordinate the, uh, the operation. That's probably the right frame of mind to have. And finally, my last point, put the president at the center of the decision-making process. The president is the one the American people elected to make the tough decisions. It is the president's legacy, after all, and the president should have the principal role in shaping it. Thank you very much.
Thank, thank you, Steve. Since I'm quite confident that the National Security Advisor in 2040 will have come out of this room, Absolutely. that was extremely helpful. So we'll have a better foreign pilot. The President will have a better advisor because of it. Mac, please. At the University of Maryland, we're going to have the National Security Advisor 2030. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a very disappointing panel. I mean, there's not going to be a lot of conflict between what uh, Steve Hadley said and what I'm going to say, because I think he gave a very uh, admirable, detailed, uh, and my sense of things, you know, quite honest uh, description of a mix of what uh, the National Security Advisor's role should be and what it, at least in the best uh, circumstances, is. I also have a little reticence about uh, speaking. Um, you know, if you write a book these days in the digital age, it's kind of, you know, questionable, I guess, to begin with. And then you spend all this time trying to communicate. Uh, my generation remembers a famous uh, song writer, librettist, piano player named Tom Lear, whose name probably doesn't ring a bell for most of the younger people here, but I'm sure. And he, uh, he said a fam made a famous comment uh, of one of his audiences. He said, you know, all these people are, all these people are sort of saying, uh, they're sort of saying that they uh, can't, you know, they can't communicate. They're having trouble communicating. He says, you know, damn it, if people can't communicate, the least they can do is shut up. <laughs> So you sort of think, if you haven't communicated in the book, maybe you should shut But we get invited to do these things. We get the honor of being on a panel with uh, Steve Hadley and with Jim Dolgeyer and with uh, Jim Lebovic, who uh, set this thing up and did so wonderful writing her on it. So it's a privilege. Let me, uh, um, let me talk probably more briefly. Professor, you're never, one of the things you're never supposed to believe uh, is, of course, a professor saying, I won't use all my time. <laughs> But uh, I will probably be briefer than Steve, partly because he's made my job easy. Because what I want to say, essentially, is uh, I want to talk about two models of the National Security Advisor job. And one of these models is what I would call the broker manager plus model. The second is what I would call the policy guru <laughs> model. They're quite different. The, uh, my theme is sort of stimulated by reactions to the, to the appointment of Tom Donilon to the position a few months ago uh, to replace General Jones. And there were two types of reactions. One group uh, in which I was relatively positive, which I put myself in this group. And we were sort of saying, Obama needs somebody close in who he trusts who messes with his own decision style, who will, uh, you know, who will, who knows the substance, who knows the players, who works very hard, and who will be able to uh, manage the process and be trusted to oversee the decision process. General Jones, a man, man of many virtues, did not, as it turned out, meet the criteria of closeness or compatibility or sync with the president's style of operation. Uh, therefore, it makes sense to give Donilon the job, partly because he's already been doing it. Uh, there was, you, you guys wouldn't understand this in, uh, at GW because it, you don't have any grass on your campus. But there's a, uh, there's a, uh, uh, not very much. I, I, uh, but there was a, uh, apparently college in Oregon that opened up and they built a bunch of buildings and they didn't build any sidewalks. And people said, well, why don't you have sidewalks between buildings? And they said, well, we want to see where the students walk. When we see where the grass is worn, then we will build the sidewalks. Well, you can say, in a sense, that Obama chose his second national security advisor by having a relatively open process that he managed himself. And then when he found out who, in fact, was managing it more than any other single individual, that person then becomes his uh, you know, national security advisor, Mr. Donnelly. Anyway, um, there, he beca you know, he's, he'd served as a sort of a super deputy to, uh, in terms of both managing the deputy's process and doing some of the you know, issue management that the National Security Advisor normally does. So it makes sense, you know, make him, give him the job. The other group said that the problem was not so much a process problem. It was that the administration's policy lacked real coherence. A lot of good rhetoric. 
not very much, but not you know an integrate, not a truly integrated strategy. And it needed somebody close to the president to oversee the development and execution of a strategy. Uh, Tom Donilon doesn't seem to fill this need, though he's smart. He knows the substance, knows the politics, and knows the people. One needed instead a Kissinger type, somebody who is a really a front rank policy thinker who would be able, working with the president, to develop and carry out a grand strategy. Grand strategy, I'm sure you know, is a popular word among academics these days. The first, uh, the broker manager, can be called in reverse historical and alphabetical order, the Scowcroft Bundy model, uh, named for Brent Scowcroft, who had the job under George H.W. Bush, as many of you know, and George Bundy, who, you know, who essentially invented the position of the modern National Security Advisor under John F. Kennedy many years before. The second, reversing only the alphabet, is the Kissinger Brzezinski model. Henry Kissinger, who served both Richard Nixon and then uh, Gerald Ford, though the latter mainly as Secretary of State, and Zbigniew Brzezinski, who served uh, Jimmy Carter. In our final chapter, built on the Scowcroft experience and the Scowcroft model, we say essentially that there are three core things the National Security Advisor should do. And um, we might have said it better if we heard uh, Steve Hadley's talk before, but there's not a lot of difference, actually. He said, first of all, establish trust among the principal players. Second, build, now, based on that trust at the cabinet level, build a multi-level effective policy process that hopefully replicates this trust down at lower levels. And third, get close to the president and stay close. The, I should say that you know, in defense of General Jones that I think he tried in, to play the broker role in important respects. And if you read the Woodward book, there are clearly more than one occasion when she's trying very hard to extend the president's options, prevent things, premature closure, and things like that. And the fact that he didn't, uh, that there were limitations I mentioned. But I think the, in any case, the, uh, um, this assumes that the job is to manage decisions and issues, to connect people to the president and vice versa, to be sure that options are viewed and important arguments heard, and to communicate decisions or have the president communicate the decisions and to oversee their implementation. Uh, the, uh, the NSC, the National Security <coughs> Advisor and his staff will need to be deeply versed in the substance of the issues and will certainly have her or his personal views and the president will typically insist on hearing those views. But the assistant who gives priority to pressing the own public line, policy line, particularly if, if the priority is done in public, uh, and especially before he or she builds trust and confidence, this person will generate conflict, energize rivals, and if he prevails, leave a residue of resentment and unresolved internal conflicts within the government. Now, Bundy once said that his role was that of a telephone operator, he, that he ran a telephone switchboard. You know, somebody would call up and try to connect to the president, he would make the connection. Uh, it was gross understatement <laughs> of his substantive virtuosity as well as his process virtuosity. Nevertheless, there was more than a, more than a grain of truth, a kernel of truth to that. Because I guess if I would have one sort of addition, though not uh, dissent from what Steve had, there's a lot of the pr policy process doesn't take place in all that orderly a manner because the issues are popping. They come up, the specific things need to be checked with the president. The president may not need to make a decision, but he may need to know that somebody else is ready to make a decision, and if so if he wants to, and they want to be sure the president is on board, et cetera. And the assistant has to be able to at once get stuff to the president to be sure the players are connected. So running a, you know, running a telephone switchboard, obviously, is far from the only thing, but it's not totally bad. And of course, you guys don't know what a telephone switchboard is. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, and, but of course, a lot of this depends on the president. I mean, Bundy worked for Kennedy. Kennedy wanted open lines of communication between him and those who he trusted. Bundy was a policy skeptic who also believed in open lines of communication. 
and was adept in developing and maintaining them, particularly with people who the pre whose views the president trusted or whose views that interested or entertained the president. Presidents often want to be stimulated, often want to be entertained, and uh, Gandhi did that too. He departed from this model with, when he worked for Lyndon Johnson. His relationship with Johnson was not the same. It wasn't that. Uh, it was mutual, there was mutual suspicion and anxiety on both sides. And uh, in the end, he ended up pushing his own preferences substantive and procedurally. That's probably why he ends up the second person listed in our book in terms of the development of the, the model. It's the Scowcroft Bundy, because Brent Scowcroft so epitomized this role and was, uh, and one of, the one of the testimonials to Scowcroft is that he, pretty much everybody, you know, uh, Steve Hadley can speak for himself, but pretty much everybody, but of course you work for Brent, <laughs> I mean pretty much everybody following him, regardless of party, pointed, if they said, what kind of national security advisor do you want to be, they sort of pointed to Brent. Scowcroft as the model. So that's one way of reaching it. Now, in theory, a president with a national security advisor pursuing this model could end up with all options and no persistent content. Could end up with something, you know, a kind of a vacuous uh, policy process. In practice, I think it's not likely to end up this way because the president will set priorities, at least ad hoc, and the assistant will be, the assistant to the president for national security will increasingly be operating within those priorities and hopefully the cabinet as well and the senior people and they will be, they, so they, but nevertheless this, this does not of course in itself produce a grand strategy. Hence the presidential guru, the president's guru alternative. The underlying assumption is the president is, you'll see I don't like this option very much but I hope some of you people do and you can argue with it. President is a politician with awesome power but limited foreign policy knowledge. He needs not just a tutor, a role that Condoleezza Rice reportedly played very well for George W. Bush, but a grand framer of policy, and perhaps even a grand articulator <coughs> of policy. Now, every assistant plays a bit of this role. Uh, Walt Rostow played perhaps more than a little bit of this with Lyndon Johnson. He was the first, uh, what about the second academic told us. But the two models are Henry Kissinger, under Nixon and Zbigniew Brzezinski under <coughs> Carter. Uh, the first, uh, Kissinger worked for a president who discovered he didn't want much communication, who wanted to shut people off, basically, because he couldn't handle the tension and the conflict of his personal relationships with them. Uh, he was threatened by it in a peculiar way. So he entered into an extraordinarily awkward and extraordinarily productive relationship with a Harvard professor he had barely met and became extraordinarily dependent on him because the prose process left him with no alternative. It led to major policy breakthroughs, uh, China, the China opening being by far the most dramatic and enduring. It also alienated much of the government and much of the broader foreign policy community. Now, Zbigniew Brzezinski played this role less successfully, I think, for Jimmy Carter. He can be credited with real policy successes, uh, the normalization of U.S. relations with China, the, close, the completion of the negotiation of the SALT II agreement, with Moscow being among them. But uh, unlike the reputation, of the policy reputation of the Nixon administration, the, policy, the word used to dis typically describe the Carter administration was disarray, not coherence. And this is how the administration is remembered, and to a significant degree, this was the case. The case, uh, because I think what Brzezinski often did when he spoke publicly, which is not as much as some, not as much if you look at the count as some national security advisors, but he did it more often, too much in his own, too much on his own. A uh, kind of Lisa Rice, when we did a count, was probably the most visible national security riser in history. But she did not distort the process in this play because it was clear that she was speaking for the administration. She was speaking for the president. And so this was, if I, I still think it's better if the national security advisor uh, has a minimal visibility, but if they're gonna be visible, speak, I don't do it, do it as the straight, uh, and she was, she had the advantage of being a, a a, both a very reliable and a very articulate <laughs> spokesperson for the president. Um, one, pro one problem with this approach 
is that the national security advisor loses trust because he is pushing his own views at colleagues' expense. Another, especially in the, uh, came out about vis-a-vis uh, -vis Nixon, and I confess it didn't, I didn't fully realize how much this was true until I went back, having written about this stuff when Nixon was president, and then going back <laughs> with the mass of documents, the mass of documentary evidence, that when uh, the president uh, developed enormous uh, resentment of Kissinger because Kissinger was getting the credit for things. And, every, and pe the public was all too willing, the press, the academics were all too willing to say, well, there's a good guy and a bad guy in this administration. Nixon's the bad guy. Kissinger's the guy. Anything good in the administration. Uh, when, now, this happened not to, uh, not to be true, actually. Uh, if you look historically, uh, Nixon was, at least earlier, more responsible for the China opening than Kissinger. But nevertheless, that's what everybody, of course, Kissinger was the man who went there, so everybody. Uh, I think also this is founded on a false premise, that an aide can shape the president in some fundamental intellectual way. I thought uh, we make in our book, we make a number of criticisms of uh, your predecessor, kind of Lisa Rice, in terms of, which, of the, how she handled the job, though a lot of it was not entirely, not mainly her fault, perhaps. It was partly the way, the fractiousness of the team which she was trying to coordinate. But one I thought, the common academic criticism, which I thought was betrayed not that much sense of the process, was she's a realist. This George Bush is floating around with this kind of fuzzy idealism about the world. She ought to take him down and shape, you know, shape him, you know, make him, make him, make him understand that the, you know the way the world really works and everything like. That. Well, she made him understand a lot of details, but I think the notion that you that the assistant is going to dominate the intellectual conversation and change the worldview of the president. Well, I suppose it might happen sometime in the lifetime of the United States on this planet. But it's highly unlikely, given uh, part of what Steve Hadley has said about the, the president having earned the job is going to be the dominant figure. And this person in particular is heavily dependent on the president. All senior people are dependent on the president. But this person particularly, because the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, have additional constituencies and they have public visibility, which doesn't make them not dependent on the president, but it does give them so give them other options. Where's the, where's the so I think the uh, the fact that um, so I think the notion that uh, that an intellectual is going to uh, the reason Kissinger was able to uh, play this role uh, effectively for Nixon was that Nixon was no mean conceptualizer himself. I mean, I've said very negative things about, Kissing, about Nixon, and I don't like him as a president, but he was extraordinarily intelligent. He had very good, very well-developed, interesting foreign policy views, lots of determination to bring them about. And so it was possible for him to interact with a conceptualizing national security advisor and develop some of the important uh, policy overtures. Of course, uh, Finally, uh, I should say, and I will then stop, and we can then get to the interesting part, which is your questions. Um, the, uh, there are limits into how you can divide this into categories, how you conceptualize it, or how we can, uh, as outsiders, so really me as an outsider, can shape or influence how the process is done. A lot of it, I think we also even tend to intellectualize too much about saying, well, the president came into office determined to have this kind of system. I could, if I had time, I could make an argument that most of these presidents came into office with no real idea of what it was like to be president. And a lot of the way the system evolved was basically turned out to be, you know, matters of personal style, how they, their experience and so forth. Not, uh, I mean, uh, George H.W. Bush is probably the main exception post Eisenhower to this role in the sense that he did, he'd never been president, but he at least had a lot of exposure and experience to it. But almost nobody else did. I mean, Nixon came into office saying he was going to restore the National Security Council, which he meant that he was going to have all these meetings of senior people. Turns out he gets in. He doesn't, he loved these meetings when he was vice president because he was invited. <laughs> he was always invited when he's president, <laughs> regardless of the meeting. So he didn't like it. It turned out he didn't like them for reasons. So he stopped having them. And, and, and that was, so I think, what I'm saying, I guess, in conclusion, is we have to have a certain amount of modesty about 
how much systems cohort with people's expectations, and we also have to recognize that the president does drive the system. I think this president, uh, at least as much as most others, uh, President Obama is very much, you know, running, similarly running his own system. Uh, I suppose better than most presidents would run it, though I'm not certain I'm comfortable with that. And I think I'm hopefully hopeful that Tom Donilon takes some of this burden away from him. But, I, but in any case, Obama will be Obama, and he won't be what some academic or what some national security assistant decides he should be. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Um, I am going to start uh, with one question for both of them, and then I have uh, an additional question for each of them. Uh, and then uh, we'll open it up uh, to questions from you all. I, I wanted to start, Steve, you talked about the role of the president in making decisions. One of the other things that the president has to do is build su domestic political support for his foreign policy. I was wondering uh, if each of you could Say a little bit about what you think the proper role is for the National Security Advisor in that aspect of the job, especially since you both seem to agree that the National Security Advisor should be uh, less visible uh, in, in uh, performing, the, performing the job. Um, I can be brief on that. What I did was when there was a legislative strategy or public communication strategy, which are usually flip sides of the same thing. I would go down to the chief of staff's office, Andy Carter, Josh Bolton, and I would say, we need to have a meeting to talk about the strategy for Petraeus and Crocker coming in September of 2006 to testify for the Congress. And we need communications and political people, and we need legislative strategy. And Josh, you can pull them all together around the table in your office and let's develop a strategy. I can input the policy piece, and I've got communications alleged people, but we need the White House staff engaged. So that really was what I did, because there are senior folks. Interestingly, you know, on this politics, Karl Rove never went to a single NSC meeting, because the president wanted national security discussions with his principals to be in national security terms. Carl could come to him privately and tell him what he thought on the merits or what he thought the politics were. But the President wanted his National Security Council to be about national security substance. But that left me free to go to Josh Bolton and have Carl and Dan Bartlett and, you know, all the legislative folks in the room to develop the overall legislative communication strategy. I think that's a good formula. That sounds reasonable to me. I, I guess two things. One, I, the National Security Advisor and his senior people have to be aware of and think about the public face of policy and think about how things are going to look, what is going to be the rationale, how can something be explained and articulated in ways that will get public support. And, and in this more fractious, more media-centric, more combative, more negative political era, unfortunately this is even more important and it probably means you have to have more staff people thinking about that than you used to have back in the 60s or 70s. On the other hand, I do think it's, it's, it's uh, there are a lot of disadvantages if the uh, um, National Security Advisor becomes, as has <coughs> seldom happened in extremists, uh, the prime presenter of the policy. I think you sometimes have problems in the sense that you, ideally you would like the President and the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense within their jurisdictions to be the primary articulator. Well, President's no problem, but it may be whether the Secretary of State or the Secretary of Defense are good at doing this will vary. I mean, one of the uh, Carter administration problems, to say something as big as defense, is that uh, the, uh, his, Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State, wasn't that interested in or that good at policy articulation. He was a great internal player. I always thought that, uh, I wasn't sure Brzezinski would be a good Secretary of State, but I always thought Vance would have been a very good National Security Advisor, because I thought that he had a lot of expertise and he had the sense of the process and everything. But, but it's, so I think that those would be my two points. I think has to, and uh, I, I defer to uh, Steve on how you do it operationally. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, in, the, in this 
uh, brilliant Dalder Dessler uh, book, you're quoted as saying that uh, you would give yourselves a D minus for execution in the first term. And uh, I just uh, wanted to know sort of your thoughts on why, why is the implementation part so diff what makes the implementation part so difficult that you would earn a D minus? This, this, I'm a big, I've spent a lot of time with Bob Woodward over my <laughs> career, but this is evidence of, you know, never talk to Bob Woodward. What I said to Bob was. <laughs> you can tell us why people talk to Bob Woodward. Uh, if he would be laughing if he were here. What I said to him was I would give the government, the government, a B, B minus in policy development and a D, D minus in policy implementation execution. Yeah. And why I said that was the national security process has been for 40 years working on developing policy options and getting decisions. And we do that relatively well. But if you, is the one thing about the Tower Commission report that I helped write, and Brent Scowcroft was one of the three principals on the Tower Commission, so it does heavily reflect his views. He said the NSC should not be involved at all in execution of policy. What he meant was the NSC should not be operational, should not be yeah, running right. operations, getting in the way. Right. But there is a, an important role for coordinating execution and implementation. Um, to develop a plan that assigns responsibilities to agencies, gives them missions, due dates, clear accountability, and then rides herd to make it, to get it done. Because if you don't, you get business as usual execution, which never happens. And it, and on things like Iraq and Afghanistan, which are very hard, you have to have really good execution because the best policy in the world is not useful if it isn't implemented and doesn't produce the effects on the ground. So we did a number of things to improve the focus on coordinating execution, not doing it, but coordinating execution. Doug Lute was brought in and given responsibility. I almost got fired for that. At least that was what some members of the Congress thought. But I wanted to have someone in the senior level who could walk right into the President's office, could call the Secretary of State and call the Secretary of Defense, and would spend 100 percent of their time implementing the President's strategies on Iraq and Afghanistan. Because if we did not have someone focusing on that implementation and getting decisions out of the bureaucracy, it would not have succeeded. So there are a number of things, and I, I won't belabor them, but I think it is a new area for the national security staff to figure out how to help and coordinate and ensure effective implementation and execution of presidential strategies and decisions. Great. Thank you. And then for Mac, we, we've seen national security advisors essentially from three different types of backgrounds. We've had the academics, we've had the lawyers, uh, we, and we've had the, the former generals. Uh, and um, just uh, having studied uh, all of these, uh, you uh, have certainly written about all these different types and the pros and cons of each of the individuals. But I was just curious whether you have thoughts in general about whether the background of the individual makes a difference in terms of how he or she uh, carries out the role and, and uh, what, uh, whether there are any major uh, pitfalls uh, that are involved with having a lawyer or a general or, a, or an academic doing the job. Okay, so those are my three categories. Um, are there more? Uh, I, one of the reasons I haven't gotten anywhere in life is I, I sometimes speak against interest. I'm not particularly in favor of academics doing this job. I'm particularly not in favor of academic policy gurus doing this job, partly for reasons I mentioned earlier that I will not repeat. Now, if you do have an academic, I would like to have an academic who has run a process, who has had a job that involved moving people or getting people to do things rather than doing the things oneself. In you know, a lot of academics is uh, individual, is combination maybe of individual research and analysis. It's sometimes a lot of individual self-promotion in the sense of you know, getting your stuff out, getting it to the right people, getting in the media, et cetera. Um, and that may or may not, that to me is not exactly the ideal uh, preparation for this, where you're going to have to have relationships of confidence, you're going to have to have a sense of process and so forth. Now, uh, there are academics who, particularly if academics have sort of had multiple tours 
in government. I mean, I don't think this is a possibility. I mean, somebody like a Joe Nye, who is an academic, but who does arranging crap, seems to be, could be a plausible, could have been, or could be, at some point, could have been a plausible national security advisor, even though he's a you know, highly respected senior academic in his own right, because part of, just because of the role he's played in terms of uh, you know, collaboration, in terms of prior government service, et cetera. But I think, and uh, I think uh, Bundy had that role because he had been dean of Harvard and he had to manage all these egos and manage to be very, you know, be responsive to them, go for quality, but still be popular, which was in, which was quite an achievement. Um, when he left, the uh, dean of the president of Harvard, Pusey, said he wasn't going to replace him because he wanted to be president himself of the university for a while. Um, but, I, but I think so. So uh, <laughs> lawyers, I think again, lawyers tend to sometimes they're solo acts. I mean, sometimes success is, you know, and so I would, if I was a lawyer, I would also look for, I mean, somebody like Steve who had process experience at multiple levels, who would, you know, have a, so I would, uh, and then, then generals, I would, I know, since there was a population of one until recently, I would say, yes, go for the generals. I would say that, Colin well, you're right, Colin that's right, two, right. actually, of course, right. there are two, right. actually, both in Colin, Colin and Brent. Well, Brent, I was thinking Brent. Ford. I was thinking, yeah, well, I was thinking We've Brent and Colin. So there, so there are four occasions right. and three general and three men. Exactly. Three Good okay. Sort I think right both. Uh, I mean, I think both, and I think Scowcraft and How uh, Brent, um, uh, both of them were sort of you know, were generals who had had prior exposure to some combination of the issues and the process, and were and were you know turned out to be you know, good at it. So I think both Colin Powell as national security advisor, which was a short period of time, although the, uh, the press insisted that his face be on the book because uh, it's prominent. Can I make one comment on that? Before? Please. Yeah. yeah, please. It's, it's in com a response to uh, what Max said about the models. I actually think, as so often when you have two polarities, the truth is between the middle. And whether it is a lawyer or a general or an academic, what the job requires is a lawyer's attention to detail, a, an ability to get down into detail. So when the president says, hey, have you personally looked at this thing? Is this going to work? You can say, yes, Mr. President, I have, and I believe it will. But at the same time, you need to be able to be the president's aide, uh, in some sense, an academic partner when he works on strategy, because every president goes to strategy. I read transcripts of Richard Nixon when I was in the NSC a thousand years ago. Read transcripts of Richard Nixon's NSC meetings. He was a fabulous strategy. President George strategist. President George W. Bush was, in my view, the best strategist we had in the administration. Most presidents tend to go there. And you have to help the president by joining him in strategy. Where the strategist model falls a cropper is when you try to do that publicly and displace the Secretary of State, which is the one where the National Security Advisor most frequently gets into conflict. And then it becomes divisive and alienating and the process works down. But I think the good National Security Advisor, you got to do windows and you got to be the architect. You got to do, you got to be able on the same day to go from the biggest strategic conversation with the President thinking strategically to going through dotting the I's and crossing the T's in a presidential speech to make sure the president has not picked a wrong word. Great. Well, thank, thank you. you. Well, um, you all have been very patient, uh, so we're going we're gonna to open it up to you. I would just say if you have a question uh, relating to the uh, Rumsfeld book, uh, if it's substantive, uh, you're likely to have a better chance of getting an answer uh, than it, if it's regarding uh, individual personalities. Uh, the way that this uh, security policy forum always works, for those who haven't been here before, uh, Jim Leibovic. Uh, keeps control of the microphone. A long-standing uh, security policy forum policy, right. yes. <laughs> uh, because he's very security conscious. So uh, if you raise your hand, I'll call on you, and he will bring you the microphone so you can ask a question. OK. And I'll try to circulate randomly around the room here so you'll all have a chance. Please. Yeah. Sure. OK. Question no, over here. There's a question over there. Yeah. Okay. Given all that's going on in the Mideast right now and the variety of politics and countries and so forth, 
Uh, how do you, as, as the NSA advisor, formulate advice given that what works for Egypt doesn't work for Libya, doesn't work for Saudi Arabia? How do you come through the formula, let, not, not what your specific advice would be, but how do you go about that process? I mean, look, you got it exactly right. There, you know, what you can do is you can say there are some broad principles that you try to establish that will stand you in good stead in all these different contexts. But having done that, then, you know, it is case by case because every one of these countries in the Middle East has a very different political and cultural context, different traditions, and what's going, the, the freedom that is sweeping, the desire for freedom sweeping through the Middle East is going to play out differently. The trick is to get those two or three basic principles, which you usually have to develop in your first case, in this case Egypt, and be foresighted enough hmm. so that those same principles will work when it's Iran and Libya and Jordan and maybe if Palestinians do something on the West Bank and Israel has to respond. That, if you think about it, is a very tall order. So what I think you really try to do in that first case is develop some principles that you think you can hold to in all the different situations that are going to arise which requires looking around corners. And then you got to take them case by case, country by country, because they'll all be different. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is I think in the case by case situation, there is the conundrum of needing to have experts that who are not previously, presumably the experts on Libya and the United States government were not close to the president previously, unless it was just a random accident. And yet suddenly you want to have people who really know Gaddafi. And so the prop, so it becomes quite, a, it becomes difficult but important to try to, for the National Security Advisor is probably the single most important person to make these connections, to find out on very short notice who can be relied upon in terms of advice and information about this particular situation. And maybe it's the Assistant Secretary or of State for the area, maybe not, but you need to sort of be able to do this in the short run. I mean, I think one, the, one good example, bad example from the Obama administration, I think Sending a former ambassador to Egypt over to, con to consult with Mubarak was a very was a good idea. It was a way of you know trying to communicate credibly. At least I think it was a good idea, a way of communicating credibly with somebody who uh, Mubarak trusted. Uh, he probably should have been uh, told to shut up after that because right. I think the uh, you know having you know t to, to him. For him then to go on record as saying, you know, we have to keep Mubarak there in a situation, which was not, it was, it was not helpful. And, it, and it, so I think that's the, sort of the flip side. You have to, it's, and you can't always control those things. They just, they happen and you have to clean up. I mean. <laughs> right. And if, when you ask a question, if you could introduce yourself first, that would be great. Yes. In the okay, question over there. here. Let me go around. They tell us what the I'll hold it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, we have it. Hi, my name is uh, Ben Bloomfield. I'm a student here at GW. Thank you very much for coming to speak with us today. One of the trends which you outlined in your in your book in the Shadow of the Oval Office was a public expectation from the president of a cohesive national security strategy throughout each administration. But as we see in our in our contemporary world, that this be is becoming increasingly difficult because of the sheer complexity and number of national security threats. Do you feel that the architecture of the National Security Council should be legally adapted to deal with this? Is it even possible to have this sort of policy guru who has some sort of hedgehog an understanding of the world anymore? Or is this totally antiquated? And that was for Mr. Dessler, sorry. <laughs> I don't want a hedgehog in control of the job. Um, I, I think the world, yeah. The, the scope is broad enough and the challenges are both predictable and unpredictable in lots of ways. So I think you do need that. You do need fluidity. You need that and it's hard. People, on the one hand, people know that we don't control who's going to come to power in Egypt or Tunisia or whatever. But on the other hand, there's an, ex there's an exaggerated expectation in the media and everywhere of what the what American policy can accomplish, should accomplish, and so forth. And 
the fact is that a lot of things are going to happen in the world that are most many of which are not you know, what we want to happen, and there'll be we will have limited ability. So I think one question is, are there way and are there ways that administration, both directly and indirectly, can at least dampen expectations a little bit, or get out the word, or encourage uh, you know, encourage journalists to say, hey, here's you know, let's talk honestly. Here's what our leverage is in this situation. Here's what it isn't. And somehow get people so that, so that you get a more realistic reading. Because I agree, I think that obviously other things being equal, coherence is better than no coherence. I wrote a book a long time ago when I said I wanted to organize government so the president could pursue a, a, a rational and coherent uh, uh, purpose of foreign policy. Uh, I think it's, it's very hard to do that in a, in a full sense. And I think the world intervenes. But so, I, so some. One element is obviously to try. Consistency is better than inconsistency, and the National Security Advisor is probably the best single person place to not, to think about how things relate to one another and to try to draw the connections. But it's also true. I think you need to, uh, you know, dampen expectations to the degree you can. Okay. Another question over here. I am uh, Major Patrick Self, U.S. Air Force. I'm going out to work in the, as the uh, Assistant Air Attaché in Kiev, Ukraine, in a couple of months. Right, right. My and uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm thank you very much both and uh, I'm, I'm wondering there's been some uh, talk and criticism about expanding Goldwater Nichols to the, de the various departments uh, getting state and defense to work more closely together on common headquarters you know getting more state participation in combatant commands like UCOM and CENTCOM and I, I'm wondering you know there's been over the past several years uh, with the provincial reconstruction teams and even the country team at the embassies of having an interagency organization establishing and, and corralling the different departments to work together better. Do you think the National Security Council could benefit from expanding uh, so that it has more bandwidth to, to, to get the different departments to march in the same direction? Thank you. I'm not a big fan of a big NSC. If the problem is integration, seeing relationships, setting priorities, my view is more information in fewer heads is better. Because when you get too big, you basically reproduce all the stovepipes and divisions within the interagency. Second, we spent 60 years since World War II learning how to recruit, train, exercise, fight, and improve our military. Huge effort, a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of people. And we have got the best military we've ever had and the best military in the world. What we have not done is spent a similar effort to develop the civilian capacity to deploy with our military in a post-conflict situation to help broken societies build polices, police force, armies, judges, jails, get microloans going, develop local governance, all those things you need to do to create stability in post-conflict, and all things, those things you need to do to do pre-conflict to help governments that are, have a lack of capability to deal with the challenges they face. That's what we have not done. We have not made a similar effort. And it shows. Every time we have one of these things, whether it's, you know, uh, Bosnia or Iraq or Afghanistan, we treat it as a pickup game. We use a different model. It's a come as you are partner. We find party. We find that we, our State Department and Treasury Department and Agricultural Department are not organized to be expeditionary. They don't have the personnel systems. They don't have the support systems, and we are going to fail until we put more effort. And it's a very it's a terrible time to be making that argument, given the real physical challenges the government faces. But it is true. And PRTs are one of the few examples where we've actually come on to something that works. We've got to do it at a much grander scale. Let me just uh, agree with that and say uh, the notion that you deal with this by adding more people to the National Security Council staff <laughs> seems to me is that is an appealing notion that doesn't make a lot of sense when you start following it. I, silly story, about 30, 35 years ago, I was working for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I was walking around, and somebody from the receptionist desk sort of started running around, Mac, 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 the White House is calling, the White House is calling. Well, I was younger, but I still had a little bit of cool on these things, so I sort of said, 
who in the White House? <laughs> well, it turned out it was a summer intern. <laughs> no, no, no criticism of summer interns. And the, and the reason that who had been sicked on me by his boss, because I'd been bending the ear of his boss to write a definitive account of the congressional relations of the pa ratification of the Panama Canal Treaties. And his boss was, I think, thought I could, and he was supposed to do an in-house history as his summer project. And I think his boss also thought, turnabout is fair play. Let's get some, make somebody interview Dessler, make him be interviewed this time. But anyway, what the point, that's a silly point, but the point is the larger you expand staff, the more people you have who can get on the telephone or use their email and say, I'm at the White House, do this, who have the foggiest notion of what the president wants. Not just that. They don't know what a Steve Hadley wants or Steve Hadley's deputy wants because this, if the thing gets so big. And so you, now I'm not saying that some of them don't perform useful work at a different level, but there's a danger, there's a confusion. I mean, you have, I mean, there aren't very many Ollie Norths that you do, but there's an example of somebody who yeah. used, who was a very, very entrepreneurial, smart, operational guy who used a, a little bit of a mandate and a lot of entrepreneurial skill to, to do an enormous amount of damage because he had the White House. Work expand to fill the space of time and people you have to do it. <laughs> And the NSC will start overseeing everything. And I used to tell our folks when people would say they're, they're overworked, because NSC's always on. Go through what you do. Figure out those things that are presidential pri priorities. That's what we're focused on. Because if we're not focused on presidential priorities in this government, nobody else is going to be. And the rest of the stuff, give back to the agencies. Yeah, I know it's interesting. Yeah, I know it's something you know about. I know it would be better if you were involved. But that's not our job. Our job is presidential priorities and being the champion for those in the government. Yeah. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Beerman. I'm also a student here at the Elliott School. Um, do you mind if I, okay. It's a little awkward. Um, <laughs> Um, you referenced the role that um, the perception of history ha plays in presidential decision making. Um, and I was, I was wondering how or whether senior staff, such as the National Security Advisor, ever seek to affect the president's view of, of history, history or historical trajectories. I'm thinking specifically of, of uh, the run up to the Iraq invasion. And, and I was curious whether you felt that um, um, people had been affected by the way the Cold War ended and that this was playing into the perception of the events in the Middle East and the Middle Eastern people's desire for freedom. And whether, um, if you can speak about this, whether you had conversations, these big picture conversations, where's history going in the next 50 years? Um, um, where's, where are the values of the world going and the value community? Thank you. Thanks. One thing is, uh, I've got three points. One, it's interesting, presidents read a lot of books while they're president and they tend to be history. And sometimes you recommend a book or two to the president. Um, second, there was that kind of conversation on Iraq. We went into Iraq for some important national security issues, but there was a discussion with the president and his senior national, advisor, national security advisors in the situation room that said, once we topple Saddam Hussein, what is our obligation to the people of Iraq? Is it to find another dictator who will be more congenial to our interests? Or do we owe, owe them something more? And the president was very strong that we owed them something more, a chance for democracy, but he was also very strong that the problem in the Middle East, you know, the, the human development deficit was a lack of freedom. And that authoritarian regimes were building their own funeral pyres and the only question was, when would somebody come by with a match? And so, over t from the very beginning, he talked about once we depose Saddam for national security purposes, we need to try to help the Iraqi people build a democratic freedom. It's what we owe them. It's what he felt the Middle East needed. And in Iraq particularly, we wanted to see if we could show that Sunnis and Shia could work together in a regime that was not based on the premise that either Sunni oppressed Shia or Shia oppressed Sunni, and both of them beat the heck out of the Kurds, because that's what a lot of the Middle East was. And 
for all the shortcomings and all the enormous sacrifice that Americans and Iraqis made in that Iraq war, and I do not downplay any of that. And with all its imperfections, it is a democratic government where Sunni and Shia and Kurds are working together for a common future for Iraq. And it's an interesting example for what's going on in Bahrain right now. So those conversations did occur. Okay, we have a question up here. Good evening, my name is Patricia Vargas. I'm an alumni of the Elliott School and I'm a current Foreign Service Officer. Um, my question is predominantly for Mr. Hadley. Um, as you know, in this current foreign policy climate, we've really seen the elevation of the three Ds, particularly the pillar of development. Um, it really is, you read the national security strategy, uh, it started with the Bush administration and has continued to a greater level with the Obama administration, elevating development. It's sort of a twofold question. First of all, you talked a lot about ebbs and flows, and then you discussed, you know, sort of this current congressional and fiscal budget. How do you mitigate those ebbs and flows when you're seeing a national security strategy go in this direction of increasing a pillar, um, but then you get Congress sort of fighting that strategy? And then additionally, what are your thoughts in terms of where development should go? You started to talk about it, but if you could share a little bit more. Well, Thank you. one of the things that you did was you corrected the publication from uh, issued by the State Department, which is at the QDDR, and you said it should be three Ds, and of course you're exactly right, it should be the quadrennial diplomacy, development, and democracy report. Um, but that's a longer conversation. <laughs> uh, I happen to be a democracy officer. There you go, very good, very good. Um, one of the problems is that there is a huge national security dimension to our current fiscal disarray and economic weakness. And if we are going to play the role we need to play in the world generally, and particularly in Asia, which is seeing the explosion of these major emerging powers, we've got to get our fiscal house in order, we've got to get our economy going, we've got to get in the free trade business because Asia is knitting itself up with free trade agreements and we are on the outside. We need to get our, everyone talks about China this, China that. We, the United States, need to get our house in order, our act together, become an attractive trading partner for the world. That will be a source of influence that we need to manage our interests in the world. So the problem is um, there is a huge national security argument for this physical structural we're going through. Unfortunately, there are going to be some casualties in the process, and there are going to be some things that we should be doing that we're not going to be able to do for a couple years until we get that started. Development is a longer discussion, but I would just remit to you the Millennium Challenge account, a very different concept of development, a partnership, not patronizing, of investing in, state, in states that are making the kinds of tough decisions to govern without corruption, to invest in their people, to use the power of free markets and free trades that will make our dollars actually produce better life for people on the ground. Too often development is conscience money. You just pay it so you feel better. It's not good enough. We owe the world something more. We owe the world an approach to development in partnership with these countries that will actually help lift people out of poverty. And that's one of the things that I think President Bush really started and put a lot of effort into and, and has not gotten the attention it deserves. But what it really needs to be is continued by the current administration. I'm sorry to say that we've reached uh, 7.15, but I wanted to uh, thank my colleagues Jim Leibovic and Christina Kahn for organizing this event. And of course, we're all very grateful to Steve Hadley and Mac Dessler for taking the time to come. Uh, and shed some light on this very important topic. So thank you. Uh, let, let me add.